All right, this evening's lecture is in, uh, in English for the benefit of our English-speaking class. And uh, just, just a quick note on about, uh, you know, I should be able to say, you know, without any further ado, Father John, and everybody knows him by now. But, but in essence, I, I want to add just a little bit how he came to be here. Uh, it was, I think, like, uh, 2019, if I'm not wrong. Uh, we had a, a fairly extensive program, and we had, uh, you know, a lot of things in it. And there's this individual who didn't wear robes showed up and attended just about every single, you know, lecture and, and uh, event that we had. He was there every single time, very attentive to everything else, and kind of asked, well, who is this person? Oh, that's Father John. Well, he didn't look like Father John. He was, you know, he looked like anyone, you know, one of us, actually. And so, but he was very attentive, whatever it is. Once I found out and I spoke to the people from Philadelphia that, that Father John hails from, and, uh, you know, we basically asked him to come back the following year. He said that he, uh, his Lithuanian is pretty good, but basically when he preaches, he wants to be natural and he's American born. So basically his English is absolutely, well, certainly better than mine. But in essence in there, he, said, I, I'd have to, you know, preach in, in English. And I said, well, that's fine. We can get the message. So thankfully, he's been able to be here every year since. COVID-20 was 20, COVID year, but in 21, 22, and this year as well, he's here. He's our uh, spiritual advisor, our chaplain, uh, mass every morning. And then we also ask him to do an update from Rome. And we never know what he's going to talk about. So basically, uh, with that in mind, this lecture is called uh, Angels Unawares, uh, the inspiration for the Synod. So we have a Synod theme coming up uh, with Father John taking us through his reflection. For sure. So uh, it's good to be back again and uh, nice to see a lot of the uh, faces again. <laughs> Um, usually I'm, I'm here to talk about the Pope and the, the gossip of Rome. And uh, so there isn't much to say. We have the same Pope still. Uh, he, he's a, his health is, uh, people ask, his health is okay, but he's gone through some health issues as someone at his age we expect. And uh, what, what we see happening in Rome with the Holy Father is that he came in as a bull in a china closet with a lot of ideas of reform, and particularly with the structural reform and the financial reform. And frankly, because I work in the financial field as the CFO for the Franciscans, he hit a brick wall because the, the structure of the Vatican Bank, the structure of the Vatican is ancient. And there are a lot of things there that just take time to change. You know, we're talking about the Synod at the earlier, confer at the earlier uh, conference and about the dreams of people, what things should be addressed. And I'm sitting in her back and saying, the church has been around for 2,000 years. Patience. <laughs> I'm not a patient person. So for me to say patience is, is pretty amazing, I think. I think that's a miracle. But I see that in working in Rome, because I've been in Rome now for eight years, and I've learned that uh, people like me come and go, and the church lives on. The structure of the Vatican lives on. So I, I think what the Pope is doing now is, I, I believe the more right approach, my background, by the way, I'm an actuary by trade, but by a uh, education of also, I have a a master's in business in organizational structures and behavior. And I still do quite a bit of work with that for the church and for the religious communities in handling issues with organizational structures and behavior. And so I see what's happening at the Vatican from that perspective. I literally live just outside of the Vatican wall. Our My tourist at the house that I live overlooks St. Peter's. We're actually hired as St. Peter's. I watch uh, his helicopter come and go and I wave to it all the time, thinking one day he may just say, who's that fool who's always waving to me, invite him for coffee. 
Uh, it hasn't happened yet. I have had four meetings with the Holy Father. So, but I'm still waiting for that coffee invitation. Uh, just as another disclosure, I do go over to Santa Marta every so often. I'm invited by various people, one of them being now Archbishop Makritskis. And I always go and I sit kind of against the wall facing the door, just in case the Holy Father comes in, <laughs> that he would see me. And uh, he has never come in while I was there. <laughs> so he's a little elusive, as they say. But uh, his, his approach now is, from my perspective, academic perspective, is probably the better approach, is that you're not gonna change everything in your papacy. What you wanna do is change structures, which will begin to change culture. And I think that's what he's uh, working more at. Uh, as of uh, last month, he has, uh, there's 137 cardinals who will now elect the next pope. Of them, he has 72% were appointed by him. So now I see some people saying, yes, yes. But let me tell you, I know of the last crew, I know five of them personally, five of the men who were made cardinals. And, uh, and I know quite a few who have been made cardinals over the year, a number of them from the United States. And I'll, I'll be telling you, my honest opinion is, they're like this, which way is the wind blowing? <laughs> so when, when uh, those who were appointed by Benedict were Benedict cardinals. But as soon as the Holy Father becomes Francis, then now they are Francis cardinals. Well, a Benedict cardinal is very different than a Francis cardinal, right? Yeah. We all know that, it's a different approach. But I, but I think a lot of it is they respond to the time that they're living in, the time that they're ministering in. And I think we have to appreciate that. Um, we have to appreciate that they are all listening to the Holy Spirit. And that is crucial, especially when we talk about the synod, because we talk about listening to the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to listen to one another, which is the synod. It's another thing to listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking through the people at the Synod, but are we listening to the Holy Spirit? And that's a question that we should always keep asking, because I don't know if it's always true. And I'll give you my experience as a friar minor. I was provincial of the friars, of the Midwest friars here in the United States for uh, four years before I was yanked away and put into Rome to take care of a problem. But while I was provincial, one of my jobs was handling the ministry assignments for friars. And I worked hard to understand where the friar is, where the church needs them, where the order needs them. I would pray over this and pray to the Holy Spirit. And I would have a friar come into me and say, you know, Father John, I, I, I've been praying and the Holy Spirit has told me I should do this. And I said, well, I too was praying. The Holy Spirit told me you should do that. So who are we really listening to? So that's what we have to be careful of. Are we really listening to the Holy Spirit? It's one thing to listen to the people, which is, I believe, the synod, to listen to the church, to listen to the people of the church, to try to break down this dichotomy that we were talking about before between hierarchy and uh, where the power is, where decisions seem to be made, and, and where the people are living, and to try to understand the relationship there a little bit differently. I believe it's happening. I believe it's slow. I believe it takes patience. I believe there are some good intentions in there. But I'll be honest with you, in Rome especially, there's a lot of um, polarization, as there are in every topic in the world that we deal with today. Even in my own family, there's polarization. It's the, the way of where we are living today. Well, I see it also with the topic of the synod, especially in Rome. I was riding in a taxi cab one time and a couple of us were in the back speaking in English and the, the driver was an Italian, but he was working on his English. So he says, I, I understand your English. You're just English because are you from America? And we said, well, yes. He says, well, what do, what do you think of the Pope in, Amer in the United States? I said, well, it depends who you talk to because it really does. Some people love him and some people aren't in love with him. You know, that's the way it goes. That's life. And he says, oh, it's not like that in Rome. I said, it's not? He says, no, he says, my uncle is a cardinal and they really don't like him. 
This is in Italy. So, now some people will tell you that the Italians at the Vatican won't like anybody unless they're Italian. That's part of the history of it. That John Paul had that problem, even so Benedict also had some of that problem. So they're waiting to get one of their guys in, into office. You know? <laughs> it, it's, it's the politics, it's life. And it makes our story interesting. It should not scandalize us. It should allow us to, to recognize that the Holy Spirit is working through our everyday experience, through our humanity. And if there's anything that Francis is trying to bring that to our attention, is our humanity. I think he's really working hard to help us embrace our humanity with all of its blessings and with its many warts. That's the way it is. So as I was uh, uh, approaching the talk, it's, it's like, well, I think last year I talked about who might be Pope. Uh, this year I was gonna do a similar presentation, but my name again wasn't on the list, so I decided not to do the presentation. <laughs> In that, in that realm, uh, I, I think a good update on that is that he has 72% of the cardinals he has appointed. And we'll see what that means. Um, some very fine, fine, fine men have been appointed. Some, I'll be honest with you, I sit there and I say, eh, okay. <laughs> but uh, some very controversial. And you may have heard uh, uh, the new... Uh, Prefect of the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith, uh, Fernandez, who came from uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, very controversial in terms of his background, his story. And apparently years ago, he, he wrote some things that some people find questionable and uh, about, especially in terms of educating youth about sexuality and things like that. Well, let me just say one thing. That was a number of years ago for him. Uh, people do grow in their faith, I hope. Academics, I hope, come to a, a different understanding. And you may say things differently today than you said 30, 40 years ago. At least I hope I'm speaking differently today than I did 40 years ago. Uh, the gray hair would suggest that it's wiser. Uh, <laughs> but don't let it fool you, because sometimes it isn't as wise. Uh, but but that's, that's who the church is. And as much as we want to place the, the bishops, priests, even priests, but bishops and cardinals up on a pedestal and to create this dichotomy, they are human beings. And the more that I work in Rome, I am more convinced that they are more human than we have ever allowed them to be. Some of them need to realize that themselves, I admit, but they really are human beings. And there are good intentions everywhere. Maybe different mindsets, different visions. The church has historically listened to that story. The synod or synodality, which I'll be the first one to say, this is my own opinion, is a bad title. It's a bad name. It doesn't work well for us Americans. It, they needed a different title, I believe. Synodality, synodality synod, you know, it's basically listening sessions. And, and we're listening on about things about mission, about vision, about who we are, about experience. Doesn't guarantee that there's gonna be a change in teaching of the church. Hopefully there will be some change in practices of the church and things that are easier to move along with. But let, let's be real about this. Just because they're listening to us, they're listening to millions of people around the world. And our experience in the United States is different than the experience in a lot of the world. I drive, I've been, I'm going this summer uh, in a couple weeks to Argentina and to Colombia. I will have traveled to 40 countries where the friars are present in the last eight years. And I have learned that there are very different experiences. I'm presenting the concept of fraternal economy to friars. And part of that is collaboration with lay people. In the United States, it's an old story. It's happening. In Canada, it's happening. In Europe, it's been happening a little bit more recently. It depends what part of Europe you're looking at. 
In Africa, don't even begin talking about it. They're not there. And that's where the church is growing. South America, the church is pretty strong there. It's not happening. Amongst the friars, lay involvement in the work of the friars at the administration level. Oh, we have people working with us all the time. But at a level where decisions are made, it just isn't happening yet. Mexico, it isn't happening yet. And so we as Americans who are more comfortable with that collaborative model, discussion model, and sometimes we have this expectation that because I said something, it should happen. It's not happening around the world yet. That's where the Holy Spirit is working to bring conversion and change amongst people. And that's what we have to continue to pray for. So the synod is a step, but it, we have to understand, I, I believe its goal has to be better stated. I'm looking at the people who are going to be representatives of the synod. I haven't been invited yet. You never know. I'm providing housing at our hotel in Rome for some of the members of the synod who want to stay at a place that's a little fresher, as I just say, it's a little newer. But we, the friars have a hotel in Rome and I oversee that hotel. So they, the, the bishops and the archbishops are calling me saying, hey, John, do you have a room at the hotel yet for you? I said, yes, $300 a night for a whole month. That's gonna give me nice revenue. <laughs> no, we're not charging $300 a night. They're getting the Father John discount, <laughs> which is 25% above market. <laughs> So never come to the hotel and say, you know, Father John, and he said, I'd get a discount because the staff knows if somebody comes and claims a discount under my name, add 25% to their bill. <laughs> so my, my hope is to engage with some of them throughout the month of October when they're there and to kind of get a feel for what's happening. Because I think the process, though I'm not sold that it's the best process, I'm, I'm sold on the fact that we need to do this. And to begin at some level to be listening. And to me, that is a way to describe what the synod is about. To listen to the experience of the people. But don't come with the expectation that what I say is going to change the world. You're talking to Romans. You're talking to Italians. You're talking to Europeans. And then there are some people from the rest of the world. Because very frankly, the Vatican still considers itself very Italian. That's the way they think, that's the way they work, and you have to learn how to work with that. It's changing. And under Francis, there have been some significant changes, especially in financial structures. But it's been slow, and in many ways, it's been very painful. And sometimes, two steps forward, one step back. That's the way it works. So that, that's the update on the atmosphere in Rome. It'll be interesting to see what happens when, he, when everyone arrives for the Synod um, and uh, to, to see what's going on with the, the conversation and the talk and, and stuff like that. So when I was asked to give another uh, presentation, I said, I don't know if I have enough information to give a full hour on an update. So I decided to do a little bit different take to try and come up with what do I what do I see as a reflection that may have, may be inspiring Francis's desire to call the Synod at this time, based on all the, the documents that Francis has put out, Pope Francis has put out over the last few years. From uh, his first document to Laudate Si, to Fratelli Tutti, these documents, th there's a consistent theme through all of them. A lot of them are rehashing the same ideas. But what, what can I point to and say, I think this is the mind, the inspiration behind. And I've come up with this uh, talk based on a particular image that is at the Vatican. If you've been there some, since 2019 and onward, you will recognize this image. If you weren't, haven't been there since 2019, I invite you to join Aldana and her group when she goes on pilgrimage to Rome and Assisi and to join them and then you will see this with your own eyes and I believe you'll feel the inspiration that I have felt from it. So, Angels Unawares, it's kind of a strange title, an inspiration for the city. I'm gonna use 
change this mic. Is it is fine? Everybody can hear me? And I apologize. I just realized when I threw these some of these images on the screen, they're not as clear as they are on my computer. And it must be because some of them I downloaded off the uh, web and they just don't have the right pixel thing. Usually I check that and I, I must not have done a good job of it. But, uh, and to me, while well, you could talk about Pope Francis and his background as a Jesuit, which is always controversial when a Franciscan talks about the background of a Jesuit. <laughs> But I have some very good friends who are Jesuits, and, and, and we celebrate well uh, together. We've toasted many things together. But uh, it's his background as a Jesuit, coming from Buenos Aires, coming from Argentina, coming from his own story, affects everything that he is and he does as the Holy Father of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And we have to realize that he is a product of who, of, of where he has come from. And uh, let me tell you a story that I think I've shared a few years ago, uh, but I don't know if all of you are here. It was my first time meeting with the Holy Father. Like I said, I've had four personal meetings. And by personal, I mean uh, myself or two or three other people or four other people at a meeting with the Holy Father. And my very first time meeting with the Holy Father was, he was in office for one year, about one year. I was still provincial in Wisconsin. And I was part of what's called the Conference of Major Superiors of Men in the United States. So it's all the men religious communities, the heads of them, the provincials, form a conference. I was part of the executive committee, and as always, I was the treasurer. I, for some reason, I always get picked to, to be the treasurer. Uh, I know nothing about money, by the way, so you know, they always, because I know that one plus one equals three, and I think that's a good idea. So I, uh, so we came here to Rome, we were invited to Rome. Actually, we, used to, we came as the executive committee, five of us, every year to meet with certain dicasteries or congregations, which are offices of the Vatican on various topics. And we'd come for about 10 days. And the one year we came, we got an invitation to meet with the Holy Father because he wanted to talk about uh, religious life, male religious life in the United States, what's happening to it. Our numbers are going down, aging, the ministries are changing, and he wanted to hear us out. So we came after lunch and uh, to a meeting with him in his library. We sat in a circle uh, with him. He sat at the end of the circle, at one side of the circle. His chair was a step higher than the rest of ours. I understand <laughs> that. That's okay. Um, uh, he came in after lunch. Uh, we knew he had spaghetti sauce. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, it's great being a friar, nothing shows. <laughs> I don't want to be a Dominican. It's too hard to keep clean. Uh, so he comes and he sits and he's kind of laughing. At this time his English wasn't very good, so he asked to speak in Portuguese. We're five Americans. <laughs> you know, if you if you speak two languages, they call you bilingual. If you speak three languages, they call you trilingual. If you speak one language, they call you an American. <laughs> and most of us here speak at least two languages. I think we speak Lithuanian and American, so we're at least bilingual. So, but he's, we're dealing through a translator in this whole meeting, which lasted just over an hour. It was a couple weeks after President Obama met with him. The President Obama's meeting lasted 36 minutes. I just like to point that out. We were there for over an hour. Uh, I guess there were five of us. So I don't know if you have to divide that by five. But we were sitting there, and he comes in, and he's laughing away, kind of giggling and smiling and smirking. And he says, I guess I caused a little stir in the United States. And uh, we were like, well, you caused a lot of stirs around the world, actually. And he said, yeah, uh, I said something that uh, offended some uh, wealthy people. And then we realized this was just a couple weeks after he had said something about wealth in the United States. And it offended some very wealthy people to the point where one wealthy donor to Notre Dame University pulled out all their funding for a, uh, I believe it was a dorm they were going to build on Notre Dame's campus. It made Wall Street Journal news, of course, everybody likes these controversial stories and it made everyone's news. And so he was kind of laughing about this. 
I had just come a couple of years earlier from San Diego, California, where I was part of building a, a 65 acre, $85 million high school campus. So I knew the value of uh, wealth and the value of relationship uh, with mission and wealth. And so I decided that I'm going to speak up. Now, my sister always tells me, John, you should keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I think some other people think that too. But, <laughs> but I said, well, Holy Father, I said, in the United States, we have great wealth. The challenge we have is connecting the wealth to the mission of the church. And so we have to be careful how we speak about things. My four compatriots, a Jesuit, a St. Francis de Sales oblate, a conventional friar, and a uh, Marist brother uh, were just looking at me, like, John, you should keep your mouth shut. The Holy Father fixed himself in his chair, and he goes, John. And the Portuguese interpreter next to us goes, John. <laughs> with the hands and everything. It was the funniest thing you could ever <laughs> And he says, where I come from, the Holy Father does this a lot, where I come from, Buenos Aires, wealth is always connected with corruption, no exception, no exception, no exception, three times he said. Then he paused and he said, maybe I must listen to other experiences. That was the birth of synod. It's about listening. And the Holy Father showed me that he is willing to listen. After he laughed a lot about it, but he was willing to listen. That was remarkable for me. So the five of us, not the Holy Father, but the five of us went out to dinner that night. We're sitting in a little restaurant that I got to know off of Port Rapio, family-owned restaurant that the grandparents gave over to their grandchildren and turned it into a silly deli. Uh, it's a nice restaurant, it's gone. But we were sitting that night having supper, and the Jesuit, Jesuit friend of mine, lifts up the glass of wine and says, a toast, a toast, to the one man at this table who will never be a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure the Holy Father was listening very well, and I got called out by name. So I'm in brown the rest of my life, and that's fine with me. But I think that gives us a, a sense of his character, a sense of his intentions. We never always agree with everything he says, and I've said this to some people before. My, my fear is sometimes the way he speaks off the cuff, which is very non-Italian. Italians are very careful, especially priests and bishops in Rome, of what they say and how they say it. They will never preach off the cuff, they will read their homily so they won't be misquoted. This is the way they are. They want to protect what they say. Pope Francis is not like that. He speaks very freely, sometimes for some people too freely, and that gets people nervous. If I were a pastor in the parish, I would be very nervous. And I say that's a little bit of a concern when the Holy Father, who is the Holy Father, I mean, you are the Holy Father. Everybody listens to you. Whether they agree with you or not is another thing, but they all hear what you say, and they will interpret what they can. <coughs> but when he speaks, it's the parish priest who sees his parishioners every Sunday who has to explain what's going on. And that isn't always fair. So if I had the chance to tell the Holy Father, you know me, I would tell him that. I think he's doing better as he got on with his spur of the moment remarks, but that's his character. He comes from Buenos Aires. He's a Jesuit. What do we expect? <laughs> I mean, he's himself. I'd rather have a person who's honestly himself than hiding behind an Italian bella figura, where everything looks good on the outside, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. There's a certain honesty about him that I think is very helpful for the church at this time, though I don't always agree with it, but it's helpful for the church, and I think it it's really speaks to the mission of the city. How did he get here? I looked around 
St. Peter's. You may recognize St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, this is the the the, uh, the top of the uh, uh, dome that I see from my terrace every day, from my office and from my bedroom. And I thought something here is speaking to the Holy Father because it speaks to people. If you've ever been there, there's a feeling, there's an experience. It's it's not just about visiting old buildings or seeing tombs of dead people who've been dead for years. But there's something there that speaks to the experience of where we are today as church. So you look at, and this is, my picture looks great. Yours doesn't look that clear, but you kind of get a sense. This is St. Peter's from the sky. It, it's, it's, it's a marvel to look at. And there's a lot of stuff here that speaks to people. And the Pope lives here. If you look at the... Uh, um, basilica. Oops. The Pope's house is over here, Santa Marta. That's where I go to try to see him for lunch. But he's never been there when I was there. I guess nobody ever informed him that I was coming. <laughs> so, there, there, again, there, it, there is history there. there. There is meaning, there is purpose, there is life. There is a lot of stuff going on here. So, so what could be making an impression? You know, you look up the Conciliazione, think back in, in the times of Mussolini, there were houses here. Mussolini knocked them all down to build this way because he felt that people from the river, the Tiber River, should see St. Peter's. Mussolini was actually a pretty good friend of the Roman Catholic Church in terms of what he did. Uh, I wouldn't say he was a nice person all the time, but. He, he did things for the church here. Probably uh, Francis would not approve, but many people were displaced because there were houses here. Most of the buildings along here are owned by, uh, the, the property is not Vatican property, but the buildings are owned by the Vatican. It's extraterritorial. Most of the offices are in these buildings. But you come up to St. Peter's and you see this magnificent thing and you gotta say, what's happening here? You know, you have a Pope who's talking about the periphery, the poor and stuff, and you have this, mammoth building. People say the church is rich. Well, the church is property rich, but cash poor. And I happen to know that for a fact. So, uh, and who's going to buy the basilica if you try to sell it? <laughs> Probably some Saudi prince or something like that. But begin to look around the basilica. What do you see on the top of the facade, the, the front facade? There are statues, these statues. There are 13 statues there. So just off the top of your head, I'm gonna make this a little engaging. What do you think they represent? Who are the 13 up there? Does anybody know? Apostles. Ah, good guess, good guess. So so let's get down to it a little bit here. We have at the center, we have Christ crucified. So that's 13 minus one, so we're now down to 12. Makes sense, right? Apostles. Maybe the apostles are inspiring. Hmm. If we're look looking at the uh, image to the left, is John the Baptist. So he wasn't an apostle. So we take off two, off of the 13, we're down to 11. So who are the 11 now? Can it be the apostles? Why would it only be 11? Minus Judas. Good guess. Brilliant guess. Wonderful guess, but wrong. <laughs> Because if you look here, it tells you who the apostles are. And over here on this side is Thaddeus. And if you know your church history, Thaddeus replaced Judas. So there's still, there's 12 now, there should be. But we're down to 11. Why only 11? There's no Peter. Why not? Because Peter is in the tomb. So is this what's inspiring, Francis? Is it really Peter and the apostles? Is it what's moving him to this? A uh, little story about the tomb. We can always talk about, we have, we know where the tomb of Peter is, but we don't know if Peter, where Peter is. Because <laughs> when they opened up the tomb in the 1950s, they found the tomb was empty. Though it said, here lies Peter, it was full. So Peter, there's nobody in the tomb. But they found remains on the outside of the tomb. There's a whole story of how this could have happened. 
going back to Constantine in the fourth century, when Peter and Paul were moved out of their tombs to, to safety in San Sebastián, the catacombs. So the catacombs are outside of the city of Rome. Peter and Paul were moved there because they were afraid that people would take them for relics, you know, cut, take a piece of a saint and, and it's worth something type of thing. Plus, the, the Christians in the fourth century were still worshiping in the catacombs, and so it made sense up until the fourth century. So somewhere in the second century, they moved them. It's Constantine who moved them back when he built the first basilica, both one for Paul and then one for Peter. So he put Peter back in his tomb, and he might have just missed the hole. <laughs> that's probably what happened. At least that's my explanation. It's logical. It makes sense. If you have a better story, let me know. <laughs> but here's the, 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 before the tomb of Peter, down on the lower level, the, the lower of the, uh, the levels of the uh, tombs of the popes. So it's not there. I don't find anything special there. Maybe it's in, in this whole thing of where the Pope comes out and he speaks to the people because we have a certain character of Francis from the day he was elected. If you remember when the day he was elected, he comes out, he looked a little shy when he came out on that, uh, on the loggia. But the reality is he knew that he was the runner up to Benedict and we have since found out because somebody snuck out the secrets that he was the runner up to Benedict. And there was a good chance that he was going to be elected Pope. A lot of people were talking about it, except in the United States. He was not on any list in the United States. They had people like Cardinal Dolan, who I was saying, there's no way Cardinal Dolan's going to be elected to Pope. Nice guy. I knew him in Milwaukee personally. Great guy. But there's no way a beer drinking, back slapping, funny Irishman is going to be elected <laughs> Pope. It's just not going to happen. You got to know the, the, the way it works. Uh, it's going to be somebody else. But Pope Francis comes out and a little shy and he says, Bona Santa, good evening. And he asks, he asks the people to bless him. Think about that. The piazza is full of people. They all heard that the white smoke came up. The new pope is going to be presented. Nobody knows who it is. So everyone from Rome, this is a Roman thing. It's not a Catholic thing. This is a Roman thing. So who's in that piazza? Well, of course, there are some good Catholics. There are some marginal Catholics. There are some other Christians. There are some non-Christians. There are Jews. There's probably some agnostics. They're all standing there. And the Pope says, good evening. Will you bless me? The Pope asked the people, no matter who they were, holy with warts, to bless him. That sets the stage for his papacy. That sets the stage for the sin. It's how he approaches church. And it's visible from the beginning of his papacy. It just takes time to get there. In a remarkable way, he asks to be blessed. So that's a sign of the sin, but I don't think it's the inspiration. And again, I apologize. This is also not a good, looks great on my screen. You should come up and look at it. Uh, these are the holy doors. As you walk into the, uh, into the entranceway, into the uh, portico of St. Peter's, all the way over to the right, with the holy year doors. These were doors that were uh, dedicated by Switzerland in honor of all the work that the Holy Father did at the end of the Second World War, they dedicated these doors and presented them at the end of the Second World War. These doors are only open when there's a holy year. There's a holy year every 25 years, unless the Pope decides to do other. And this Holy Father has already done two other holy years. Maybe he didn't think he was going to live to the 25th anniversary of 2025, but he's done two years, and the next one is 2025. These doors are swung open great image that exists of the holy year for religious life is when 
the Holy Father opens the doors. They're sealed on the inside by them. It's like a plaster wall. They chop that open when they're going to open them. But on the outside, this is what you see. He pushes the doors in, and Benedict is standing on the inside. And there's a great picture of the two of them embracing. So all of these stories that you hear about the conflicts between Benedict and, and Francis, of course there's some, there's, there's gotta be disagreements. They came at the church from different perspectives and from very different experiences. But both of them had a love for the church and a respect for the papacy, for the position that they were called to fill. I am convinced of that. And that's an image, the Holy Year image, that just sits in my mind. You could walk into the Basilica and there's a lot of things there that could speak to Francis about what is this uh, synod going to be about. It's kind of magnificent when you walk in. I like to walk in with teenagers and I always walk in backwards, watching them as they come in, because they come in and it's this. <laughs> because it, it's just overwhelming and magnificent. There's so much there. Considering where, how the Holy Father approaches different peoples, the, the point of people's suffering is very important to him. So I wonder sometimes if something like the Pietà, which is uh, Michelangelo's uh, carving, uh, sculpture, which is you're walking his right to the right. I wonder if that wasn't some influence to Francis. Uh, the suffering of Christ and, and the suffering of Mary holding the suffering of Christ. The relationship there. I don't know if you know this was uh, the first sculptor of sculpture of uh, Michelangelo. He was 25 years old when he did this, and he has never signed any of his sculptures except this one. And he only signed this after this was revealed. And there were some cardinals standing around, thinking about, well, who, who's the sculpture here? And they were naming all these big time sculptures at the time. And Michelangelo said, "I'm thinking, no, this is this is mine." So he came back that evening and signed this across the breastplate of Mary, the son of Michelangelo. The only time he had to sign any of the sculptures. From then on, everybody knew who he was. But somehow this image, I think, is real powerful. And, and maybe that had something to do with Francis and understanding the suffering of the church, the sufferings of people. I think that's a better way to say it. So when we speak of church, we don't mean about the institutional church. We mean people. People are the church. And so sometimes we should say that we're speaking about the suffering of the people of the church, not the institutional church. Yes, the institutional church has suffered, but most of the time it has brought on its own suffering. But the people suffer because of the powers around them. And I think Francis is in tune with that. You have the magnificent uh, uh, dome. You know, maybe the magnificence of that could inspire something. We have in, behind the main altar, we have the altar of the chair of Peter, which is quite amazing. That's a Bernini piece, all bronze, that supposedly contains inside this an actual chair that Peter sat on. As we say, legend has it, whatever that means. Uh, whether the chair of Peter is really inside this bronze, we don't know, but it represents the, the chair of Peter because the Holy Father teaches from a chair teaches from a sitting position. But the more inspiring thing for me is above this chair is this image, this window of the Holy Spirit. And not only because it's the Holy Spirit, but the history behind this window. And I think this has something to do with how Francis sees the church and sees his position. Bernini was supposed to have a bronze relief in here, some sort of a bronze image of Peter and the keys, because Peter was given the keys of the church. But he wasn't finished, uh, and winter was coming, and so they had to put something in the hole to keep the winter out of the basilica. So they put this uh, stained glass piece in there. And it's, it's just beautiful with the, with the Holy Spirit. And when the light comes in that window, it's really magnificent to watch. Well, during the winter, the, the Pope who the Bernini was working with dies. The new Pope comes in, and Bernini comes up to him and says, you know what? Uh, I have something I'm supposed to prepare for this hole here that this window is in. And the new Pope says to Bernini, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of money on you. I think the window stays. 
and the winner is staying. I think that mentality of use of resources, the mentality of recognizing what you really need and what you don't need, I think Francis touches on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, maybe this is the Holy Spirit that's inspiring him. That I don't know. I could just imagine it. But as I look out from the top of St. Peter's, I look out and say, what out here? Could be inspiring him. And I'm drawn to this one section where the star is. As you look out from St. Peter's to the right, as you're looking up through the piazza to the left. If you're familiar with the piazza wall, the right next door to this image is um, the post office trailer. Uh, a story about this section. A few years ago, uh, before 2019, Pope Francis was opening up parts of the Vatican to the poor of Rome. So he turned one section where the post office used to be in a different section, he turned that into showers so the homeless could come and take a shower. Also, there's a, a food uh, pantry to get some food there. He opened up in this section where the star is, he opened up a medical, it was like tents. And one of the cardinals, again, to understand what's going on with the mentality of the, of the Vatican, one of the cardinals pointed out to the Holy Father that, you know, Holy Father, you can't do what you want there in the piazza because St. Peter's isn't your church. St. Peter's is the church of the people, the basilica of the people. As the Bishop of Rome, St. John Lateran is the Holy Father's church. So you can't just do what you want here. You can do whatever you want at St. John Lateran on the other side of town by the Colosseum, but you can't do it here. And so he had to take down the hospital. But soon after that, something else shows up. This shows up. And from the moment I saw it, came, it showed up in 2019. It's called the, the Monument to, to the Refugees. It's been called the Monument to the Immigrants. Its official title is Angels Unawares. It depicts refugees and immigrants. And the first time I saw it, I had to look back and say, you know, this is really about my family. Not only my Friar family or my church family, but my family, my Lithuanian family. As many of us have had family members, if not yourselves, have experienced immigration, refugee status, DPs. And you know what that's all about. This is the monument, monument to all of them. And I believe this is very inspirational. Interesting, not commissioned by the Holy Father. It was commissioned by the rector of the Basilica the Archbishop, who is the head of the Basilica. Because the Holy Father realized that he's not allowed to do anything there. <laughs> and so he learned how to make it happen. This is, it's a Canadian, uh, done by a Canadian, Schmaltz. Uh, what's his first name? I forgot his first name. Schmaltz is his last name. Uh, he's known for uh, this particular image called for, uh, Jesus, the Homeless Jesus which has appeared in Toronto. There's one in Rome. Uh, I heard there's one in Paris. Uh, so he's known for these kind of images. But he was commissioned to do this monument. Uh, here's the Holy Father on the day it was uh, blessed, inaugurated, 2019. Great images, great faces. You know, One of the questions that comes up is, how many heads are here? What does this represent? Is there any connection here? And uh, it took a little while. Uh, actually, I, I thought of it and then for a while forgot about it. And then somebody asked me, so then I had to go and figure out what's going on. And there is a connection and this is remarkable. If we look at St. Peter's in particular, if we look at the colony, which is meant to be arms embracing the world. That's the idea that Bernini had with the colony. It's arms embracing the world. 
Along the top here, there are depictions of saints. Most of them are founders of religious communities and martyrs of the church. All along the top. There are 140 of them. How many heads in the statue, the monument? 140. The connection is remarkable. What is, what is the artist that the sculptor is saying about this? He's saying, you have all these saints that you recognize for the remarkable things that they've done. But this Holy Father recognizes these saints and they're not to be outnumbered. 140 on the top, 140 on the boat. When you begin to realize what that means, and, and what he's trying to say by this is remarkable, the connection. Again, faces, just look at the faces. And you can connect, they, they represent different nationalities, different parts of the world, different races, uh, different levels of economic status. It's all depicted in here. Now, honestly, I've never counted them. To make sure it's 140, I was just going by what I found out, read. Uh, I don't know if I even can count them because I don't know if you can see all the heads from any particular angle. But the faces are remarkable. They're, they're, you see the suffering, but you see the wanting, the waiting, the looking, the searching, the desire. This, this is what the faces depict. It's just remarkable. Uh, a few months ago, I was standing in front with a group of high school students, and uh, so I have all my trivia questions that I have to try to answer while looking at this. And there's a guy standing next to me, and he says, uh, do you know anything about this? I said, I know a little bit about this. So I told him some of the facts that I know. And I asked him, I said, what catches your uh, vision? What, 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 are you, what are you caught by this? And he said, this image. Because it's a Hasidic Jew. He said, I'm a Jew. He says, not always practicing, but I'm a Jew. And the fact that the Holy Father would put this image, this face, this Jew, into this statue so that I could see it, tells me he cares about me. He's listening to me. He wants to know my story. I, I just stood I said, Look, could you talk to my high school kids about this? <laughs> tell how you feel about this? And I realized that every head in this speaks to somebody in the same way. These are people that are oftentimes neglected, forgotten, pushed aside, and we as Catholics sometimes may not even consider because they're not Catholic or not Catholic the way we think they should be. And yet they're all on this, in this boat. They're all part of this journey, this, this journey of faith. I think this is what inspires the Holy Father. That he's looking, he's always talking about the people on the periphery, those who are on the outside. And you have to not only send them help, that's not what the Holy Father wants people to do. And he's challenged us friars on this. He says, I don't need you to pop in to say Sunday Mass. I need you to live with the people. I need you to step into their life so they can step into yours. That's what we're looking for here in the city, I think. He's trying to identify those, not to neglect the people that are on the in, but to identify those who feel that they're on the outs. And we could name them. You, you, you could go through and say, well, it's, it's a divorce, they're really married, it's the L. LGBTQ, 2XYZ, whatever, you know, I get all those letters mixed up. Well, from my perspective, it's the young people today. They're on the outs. And the Holy Father is looking for ways to bring them in, to put them on this boat, to realize that we're all on the same journey. And the only way we do that is by listening to each other. 
Not by thinking we have the answer, we understand the other story. It really is for me a going back to the idea of mission that came out of Second Vatican Council that we as religious have not done all that well, to be very frank. Before the Second Vatican Council, the idea of mission was, I have a story, I have a tradition, I have the Catholic way, I have it in a box and I'm going to bring it to you in Congo, I'm going to bring it to you in Myanmar, I'm going to bring it to you in Colombia, I'm going to bring, and you know what, you're going to like it, you're going to love this, this is going to be wonderful for all of you. That was the idea of mission before Vatican II. But all the documents of Vatican II that talked about mission changed it. The idea of mission of Vatican II is, we come to your place to find the Christ who is present already there. I'm not here to bring you a box of tricks or a story in a box. I'm here to discover the Christ that is present there. And I think that's what Francis is trying to get to. One way to do that is by really listening. I'm not convinced that the hierarchy of the church are on the same page all the time. But that doesn't mean you give up. You keep trying different angles. You throw images from statues and monuments in front of people. You tell stories. You get them together. And I think that's what he's trying to do. Is the synod going to be totally successful? I don't think so. But there will be some success. It's going to move the dialogue. It's going to move the process on a little bit. And that's worth it. Because some of these ideas have been around since the Second Vatican Council. We just haven't caught on to them yet as much as we have tried. And I think that's what, what's trying to happen here. The other interesting thing was the one side of the uh, monument are the ultimate images of migrants or refugees. And who might that be? The biblical image of migrants and refugees. Who might that be? The family. The Holy Family. Mary and Joseph. Mary holding the child, Joseph with a box of carpenter's tools. So when you go with Aldana to Rome and you see the statue, you have to look at the finest house. She won't be able to use it as a trivia question, but you'll have to know it's there and go look for it. And of course, the, the uh, title given. I read somewhere that the artist Schmaltz gave the title Angels and Wares. Um, then I read somewhere that no, it was actually given by a group of people who saw the image before it was made public and they gave it. So I don't know where the title came from. It's kind of awkward. And I don't know if it's because of the translation or what, but angels unaware. So you have the wings, the angel wings above it. And the idea is that well, the angels are these people who sometimes we don't even consider to be angels. Even people in this room are the angels that God has sent into our lives to help us along the journey, to help get us to where we're going, and that we can't be limited in our uh, thinking of who's going to get us there. We come from a church that has traditionally for 2,000 years talked about the role of the hierarchy or the role of the clergy or the role of the professional catechists. They've been very helpful, can't deny it. But the story of faith lives on in it through the people and the story, the way we bring each other along. And I think that's what Francis is trying to get at. That's the stories he wants people to hear in the synod talks. So it's not about changing rules and laws and restrictions and, and changing the teaching of the church. It's getting us to sit down and talk finally. Unfortunately, the numbers, as we were was reported earlier, seemed quite low in terms of participation for various reasons. And I, and even amongst the friars, I hear people who are uh, more negative about the synod and, and, and positive. And, and a lot of them, I catch them on because it's the whole word of synod. 
You know, like get over the word, get that what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to open up dialogue. We're trying to talk about people's experience. Doesn't mean things are going to change overnight, but we begin to understand each other's stories and we journey into the story. And amongst all these stories, there are angels. And angels are God's instruments to help us along the journey. They don't do the miracles in our lives. It's not that Christmas story with the bell ringing and uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Jim, yeah, Jim Stewart, but who was, what was the angel's name? Clarence. Good for you, you get the prize. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's, it's not these miracles, it's, it's, it's the conversation that the church is trying to have and open up. It's a difficult conversation because we tend to hold on to what we know and what we've experienced. And some people are trying to talk and think out of the box and to bring some reality to the experience of the church, some humanness to the experience of the church. There's an attempt. But if you were to ask, how are the bishops in the United States? Are they for it or against it? I'd say half and half. How are the bishops in Rome? I'd say 75% are against it because they're against Francis and 25% are for it. You know, amongst the friars, I see the same, the same thing in our house. You know, a lot of people are caught up in the wrong things. It's simply an opportunity to listen to the other's experience. And from there to see what can change. How can the church be more responsive to what it says its evangelization mission is? To find the Christ that is present there, the Christ that is present here. So the synod, when it's uh, actually this is an old picture because it's 2021 and 23. Now they extend it to 2024 because in the church nothing happens fast, so they had to add time to this thing, and that's just the way it works. But we have the three themes of the synod of communion, called and gifted through baptism, that each person has dignity. But notice that it still talks about baptism, which is about membership in the church and the community. And that each person there has dignity. Well, what does that mean to say that they have dignity? That baptism is not a magical moment, that it's a journey. If we haven't done anything about our faith since we were baptized or confirmed or the last time we went to confession, then we're missing out on the opportunity. So this whole thing of communion is that we are part of a group that is growing and changing and moving and learning and becoming holier as we go along. But it's a journey that doesn't end, it goes on in life. It's about participation, that we are in communion with Christ and with one another with each one of us who are one another. And for us as Catholics, obviously that great image, that great experience of unity is the Eucharist. And I think it was mentioned earlier that the Eucharist seems to be that which makes us, gives us real identity, that it is what is most important to us. And I think the Synod is, 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 has that tone to it to really understand what it means to be Eucharist, a Eucharistic community, a sacramental community. And I think that's very powerful. Uh, the, the, the conversation about this participation is that unity doesn't lead to inclusivity, but inclusivity produces unity. And I think that's a very Francis idea, that we have to see who we need to include and find the unity in that. Now, I do believe that, that, that Francis is not looking to overturn the teaching of the church, but he's trying to find how the teaching of the church relates to these individual experiences that are out there. And you want to pull those experiences into the church. So I, I, I don't expect a lot of teaching changes here. I, I'd be surprised, it would shock me. But I think what's going to be, how do we use the teaching of the church to bring people in? What are we saying and how are we living it? And getting away from particular rules and regulations. I think it's really about what I call holy hospitality. I, I grew up in a family, my mom is here. And my mom and dad used to like to throw parties all the time, have people in the house and come over for Sunday barbecues and stuff. And it was always about hospitality, but it was a certain style of hospitality because hospitality is a challenge. 
Hospitality is I allow someone to step into my life knowing that it will change me. And I then step into another life hoping that it will change them. I think that's the participation that the Synod is looking at. How can we grow by our openness to others and others' openness to us? And we have to get away from the, the, the conversation, the dialogue, the words that create the polarization that is part of so much of our lives. When we met that one time, with, I think it was the second time we met with Pope Francis, we asked him, you know, they're saying that you're a socialist, that you're a communist, and all this stuff. And he... <laughs> Don't use labels, he said. Once you label someone, you stop all conversation, all dialogue stops. Brilliant. Brilliant. Stop labeling. That'll break down the polarization. It's not whether you're right or left, whether you're conservative, republic, uh, conservative or liberal, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you're Lithuanian or Polish, it doesn't matter. Get rid of the labels. Then we could listen. Then we could possibly be hospitable to one another, allowing ourselves to be changed and trusting that we can change another by the presence of who we are, dignity from our baptism, created as, uh, as, as, as people of God. And then all obviously send out our mission. I spoke about mission as going out, not to bring something to people, but to find a Christ that is present there, sent forth. That it can't be just you in this. You have to be willing to go out. Whatever that means in terms of the going out. So that's angels and awareness. And how I think a simple statue, a simple monument, a simple sculpture can really uh, reveal a lot about where Francis and some people are at in terms of shaping what the Synod is hopefully going to do. Remind you that 2025 is going to be a jubilee year. And the theme for that year, interestingly enough, is Pilgrim's Hope. Very interesting. So, I'm five minutes over, which is not unusual. Uh, <laughs> are there any comments or questions? Uh, any, anybody else? Anybody any questions about uh, where we are in terms of uh, church or Rome? Uh, Rome is still there, it's ancient, it's old. Uh, the new mayor has cleaned it up a little, so come and see. Uh, come with Aldana and her friends and whatever. Uh, when is your, when are you coming? I'm, I'm doing her commercial. I need a mic. I'm looking, I'm hoping for the microphone. Hello, oh. got next microphone. Just got to hold it in for a bit on the mute button. Like all of that. I don't need a microphone. I just want to tell the people that the very second copy of this is in Washington Catholic University campus. Yes. And there's an improvement on that copy, identical copy of this, which a, a donor from California gave to us in the university. An improvement is that the phone is in Washington. And there is a pool. A very shallow pool, and that statue is exactly the same size, sits in the, in the campus of the university. And you may know where the university is if you have to the shrine or basilica there on the campus. It's in the vicinity of that statue as well. It looks out on the street, and this space is out there exactly as it is. Thank you. Uh, so if you can't travel to Rome with Aldona on her trip, yeah, we could go over to Washington and see the uh, replica of it, the improved replica of the water. Interesting, the whole water thing, because the water for me, again, I'll interpret a little, the water for me sense more the sense of movement, that there's movement, that you're going somewhere that's uh, than sitting outside the water. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, any other? They're trying to fix the microphone. I think I left it on here in the battery right now, but that's the way it goes. Yes? I just have a very uh, concrete question. Is the Jubilee year different from a Holy Year? It's basically the same thing. The whole Holy Year, Jubilee Year. So it's every 25 years or any time the Pope wants to call it. <laughs> so uh, there is one for 20, uh, 2025. Uh, hotels are already getting booked up. 
There's a plan to be lots of people uh, for the Jubilee year. Uh, how many of you know about Villa Lituania in Rome? Okay, so you know that the Archdiocese of the, the Bishops of the Bishops Conference of Lithuania has the Collegio, the House of Studies, where the, the seminarians live, and the, next to it is a kind of a guest house that's becoming more of a hotel. And they're preparing; they're in the midst of doing a major renovation, much needed, much needed major <laughs> renovation. So they're working on that. Uh, I'm somewhat involved in that because I run a hotel in Rome. And so they ask my advice, and I tell them charge three hundred a night. Uh, <laughs> but they're uh, but they're aiming to be open for twenty twenty five. They want to be ready for it because they know there's going to be a great need for it. it it's the, the, Rome will be crazy. It, it will be crazy. I think for the jubilee year, it was for the last one for the millennium. Yes. On the same topic, is it crazy the whole year, or is it crazier on some months than others? Uh, my experience on previous holy years, uh, there are certain events that will create greater crowds. Uh, and I don't know, I haven't seen this calendar of events. My guess is the opening, which will be Advent of 2024. Uh, so the first Sunday of December will probably be the opening of the holy year. So that would be a, a full time. Uh, my guess also Easter time will be f more people than usual. Uh, they're coming down from that holy year door, the holy door. They have a lane going all the way down Conciliazione for the pilgrims to line up. And they're lined up there for hours to come through the holy year door. Because you know, if you come through the holy year door, you get an indulgence. You know, so all the remnants of your sinfulness that have been forgiven that needs to be washed clean gets cleaned by you walking through the holy year door. Uh, saying a prayer for the Holy Father, saying an Our Father, Hail Mary, going to Mass and going to confession within a week. But only lasts till that time, if next time you sin, it starts piling up again. But it's worth the time. <laughs> we have that with the Franciscans, with our Portsiocla Chapel in Assisi. So I tell the high school kids when I'm there with their pilgrimages, and I caught one kid walking constantly, walking in and out of the door. I said, no, you can't bank this. <laughs> It just lasts for this moment. That's it. You're finished. Get out of here. Yes. Well, maybe I did I miss it in today's presentations, but how is the synod, which consists also of lay, I understand? How was it formed? You said you were not invited yet. Who invites? How was the mechanics? I think there's some other people who have been involved with the synod process in other places. It basically feeds out from the top through the conferences of uh, bishops, then to the diocese, and then through the parishes. The weakest port point, I believe, from my experience, is some parishes just didn't buy into it. I think that's part of why the numbers are low. Some pastors just didn't. And, and I know at, at St. Andrews, because in Philadelphia, because of the transition and everything, it, most of the people there didn't even know there's anything being called the synod. And, and I think it was because they're in the midst of that transition of leadership and stuff. But I think in a lot of parishes, some, some pastors are just overwhelmed. I talked to some of our guys in Wisconsin, guy who's taking care of three parishes. He says, there's just so much I can do. And that's why I mentioned earlier to somebody, I said, what they should have done, in my opinion, not that it matters, but in my opinion, what they should, should have done is given power, pastors the power to declare a moratorium on everything else you have to do in terms of meetings, committees, and things like that for three or six months. But the only thing you're going to do is the synod. Because what you're hearing, and this is what, this is what I think Rome doesn't get sometimes. Uh, people in, in, in our administration don't understand that many priests today are overworked. They're taking care of three and four parishes. They're running around like chickens without a head. Now, some of them do it well because they know how to manage. But most of these are philosophers and theologians, and so they're not trained to manage. I know that from experience. This is why I fix things. You know, it's so all of that feeds into it. So the, the message of the synod didn't get down to the grassroots. It came from the top, and the structures were passed down. That a diocese would have so many representatives, <coughs> and a parish would then have somebody take over and do the meeting and stuff like that. Just one follow-up. With the mechanics of what I'm most interested in, would it still have been the, if it works properly in those dioceses, 
Does the pastor make a selection? Does the congregation elect its members? My understanding is in most cases the pastor chose, but some pastors allow people to recommend and bring up. It varied by pastor. So it, it depends on who was doing what. And there, I have a couple I'll hand over here and then the hand over here. Which are going to go first? I just wanted to say briefly that in our parish, the pastor uh, put out announcements at every mass. Anybody who wants to volunteer to join the parish synodal team, please send in your name and, uh, and email address or whatever. So it was all volunteers. It was self-selected. Yeah. So I, uh, my question really has to do with Pope Francis and knowing his age and stories of his health and being in and out of the hospital and everything else, what do you believe is going to happen, let's say for example, if all of a sudden before October this year something happens to Francis or 2024 when the Senate is going to continue, all of these efforts and the time and that has been put in by thousands of people. What do you believe, in your opinion, is going to, if Francis is no longer there, what will happen? Well, I'm ready to take up the torch if they call me. <laughs> and white shows off my blue eyes very nicely. So uh, it's hard to say. You know, in the first five years of Francis' papacy, you heard him talk oftentimes about the place of retirement of the Pope. Honestly, the last couple of years, he hasn't talked about that. You, you just don't hear it. So I don't know if he, he thinks about it or not, but you don't hear him talking about it. Though he, he does, he apparently has signed the document and given it to the people who need to have it, that if he becomes incapacitated, he is to be resigned. And, and he has no problem with that. So apparently that document is still in place. Now, what would happen? I, my gut's feeling is that the support at the Vatican isn't strong enough to carry it without his leadership. That's my gut feeling. I believe what's keeping it moving, in, in, and I believe it's a way too small representation in terms of the voices that have been brought here uh, to the Synod, is, is his determination to see this happen. So, uh, we pray that he holds that. And I have no doubt that he will. He just, he's, he's like three cats. He has many lives, uh, not just nine, but he just keeps. And here's the thing with Pope Francis. When you see him getting ready for Mass, or even during Mass, when you see him, he's like, he doesn't look happy. And he doesn't look well, very honestly. He just doesn't. When you go to a meeting and he's. But when he gets with people, it's like somebody pumped him up with something. He is totally alive, totally different. It seems he has no aches or pains. Though when he's walking to get to the altar, he struggles. You could see it. But when he's with the people, he has a different life. There's something that works in him. And I think there's enough of that there to get him through at least this beginning part of it. And, and hopefully, hopefully the Synod will, will uh, get ground at this October meeting will ground things a little bit more because they seem loosey-goosey now because of this, I, I believe, the weakness of support. And But I, I think there's enough people that if, if October makes a good statement, a good showing, and they get the right participation, I, I think what you're talking about here, the whole voting thing, the way you're going to do make people feel that they're part of it is by seeing that their representatives have a vote. I mean, why would I get interested if the person who's representing my ideas doesn't have a say where they're going? But again, just because you have a say doesn't mean it's going to go your way. You know, it, it, this is a listening session. And we're, we're talking about the mission. We're talking about uh, ideas and, and not necessarily the teaching of the church. And, and I think that's where the struggle sometimes is. The teaching office of the church I think will fall into place after the listening session. And it's not going to happen in October. I don't think. Father John, it was maybe last year or the year before you actually 
basic predictions of who the likely successor is. Yeah. Without naming names, in your sense, will the next one be someone who wants to move the church forward or wants to move it back? I, th I think if you just look at the numbers, 72% of the cardinals have been appointed by the Holy Father, and they're appointed. I, I know men who have not been appointed, who you would think would have been appointed, but, but I know they haven't been appointed, in my sense is, because I know that they think differently on certain issues than the Pope. So the Pope is appointing people, and it's his prerogative, he's the Holy Father. You know, um, if I were the Pope, I would appoint probably my friends who think like me. No, actually, I like to get people around me who think differently than me, but whatever. I, I think he has put enough people in place that the expectation will be that this trajectory, trajectory keeps moving. But there's no guarantee. It's like I said in the beginning, I'm, I know some of these guys and they're, the finger goes out which way is the wind blowing. So when they're pope, <laughs> who knows what will happen? Anything can happen. Remember, they elected John the Twenty Third because he was an old man, and nothing is going to happen. It's going to give him time to figure out what to do, and all of a sudden he calls Vatican II. <laughs> Things like that happen in the church, luckily, in a good way. Remember him? Just have a comment. Like today, all of us have heard much more about the synod than we did before today. So I would encourage everyone to keep learning and listening. Information. Uh, the internet has a lot of good sources Vatican News, National Catholic Reporter, Bethlehem uh, Hill, Ashkenaz Calpe. So use, use this opportunity to really educate yourself yeah. and be interested in what's going on in the church and in the and, and And don't overstate your expectations, uh, but, but listen to the voices. That are, that are speaking on uh, all the voices. And some are going to be in one direction and some are going to be other. That's where the Holy Spirit works and we have to ask ourselves, are we listening to the Holy Spirit? Of course, the Holy Spirit is part of all of this, but are we listening? All done that? Do you need another commercial break? No. Okay. I just want to It's, it's, it, and I don't know if anybody here has ever experienced a USCCB meeting, because I, as a provincial, I was there from the CMS, and they, you sat at work tables, but only on one side of the table, facing the stage, and, and the, so the heads of the USCCB were up there, and they faced down, and uh, that's the way they held their meetings. So the, the structure didn't speak the dialogue. So how do you expect them to be people of dialogue if the structure that you place them in is in dialogue? In the monastery, the friary where I live, the, the dining room is the old friar's dining room. And we had tables around the edge. And you sat on one side of the table because you weren't supposed to talk to anyone. So that discouraged you from talking. This is in the past before I came. I would never survive. Uh, <laughs> and, and they served you. The brothers served you from the, the one side. So that's why you only sat on one side. Uh, about 20 years ago, some Americans who were living at our general quarry in Rome decided this is nonsense, and they went, the American friars bought three round tables and put them in the middle. And now, so we have three round tables and that, so if you want to talk, you go there. If you don't want to talk, you sit on the edge. That's <laughs> the way it works. Okay, one more, and I think we're going to... So, so, maybe that's a stupid question, like, was all that emotion, like, it's not the license? Well, it's just a suggestion. If Pope doesn't like it, he doesn't have to accept it, right? So what is that expectation that he likes it? What do you suggest? I, I don't know. I, I think it, it depends what comes out of the, the Senate. I, I, I trust that he's, I trust he's a holy man, he's a prayerful man. Uh, I also trust that he's a Jesuit. And I trust he has a mindset where he likes to see the church going. But I think by engaging in this process, he wants to find the spirit working through the people. 
And I think he's trying to work with the very ancient structures of Rome and the Vatican in the midst of that, because that's not their experience. That's not the Italian, and therefore not the Roman experience, not the Vatican experience. So th this is very new to a lot of people there. So I think he's, my sense would be that he's very realistic about it, and, and he's hoping to hear the spirit speak through, through the group. And uh, the unfortunate thing of asking for the spirit's opinion, and I've learned this in 40 years of religious life, when you ask for it, you get ready to hear it. I used to like the, the teenagers, I, I know we're gone all the time, but I used to like teenagers, they come on retreat and they're, come Holy Spirit, come. And I used to, my first homily to them is, watch what you ask for. Because if he comes, you will be changed. And I don't know if you want to change. We just had, what, 350,000 young people in Lisbon, you know, praising the Pope, long live the Pope, we love the Pope. My question always is to young people, okay, you love the Pope, but do you love what he tells you? It's a different story sometimes, but we work on it, so. Okay? Uh, Thank I was you. gonna ask you for a last sentence to kind of put it together, but you just did. So it's over, and thank you very much for your attention, and Father John, thank you very much again. We'll wait for another one. Thank you, my pleasure.